As soon as I got to India, I just felt at home. At that retreat, Ramdas was a student there. He was an old style guru. You didn't exactly know where he was going to be next, and he'd appear and disappear and be somewhere else. Looking back, I realized you don't need to become a Buddhist or join anything or reject anything else. It's really about methods. Well, the main engine for many, many approaches to meditation is mindfulness, which is really a way of trying to get closer to your experience so you can see much more accurately what your experience really is. That was really the essential tool. Okay, so before your trip, you, you meet this sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi figure, um, Trungpa Rinpoche in Buffalo. I did. Talk about that experience. I was going to the university. Uh, there was there were also other colleges in Buffalo, and Trungpa Rinpoche was a um, a Tibetan teacher, Tibetan Lama, and uh, somehow on his first trip to North America, he got sent to Buffalo <laughs> uh, to speak at one of these other colleges. So this is about four days before. Uh, I was getting ready to leave for India. And this is a small group of friends and I were going together. Some people, you know, doing things on education and, you know, like people from Buffalo. Um, and I, I was uh, 18 at this point. I was uh, very naive. I'd never even been to California before and I was about to go to India. And, and I had an idea that practices held within the Buddhist tradition, this is all from that Asian philosophy class that I took, would be like very kind of simple and direct. And mm -hmm. you also, as, as you know, they often talk about, you don't need to like become a Buddhist or join anything or reject anything else. It's really about methods. So that's what I was really aiming toward, but I had no idea where to go. Like, I don't know anything about India, you know, where to find a teacher or anything. And so there was Trungpa Rinpoche, like a living embodiment, you know, of uh, a Buddhist meditation teacher. So they asked for written questions at his talk. And I wrote out the question, like my friends and I are about to leave for India in like three or four days to study Buddhist meditation. Do you have any idea where we should go? And he had this big pile of questions in front of him and he pulled out my question and read it out loud. Do you have any idea where we should go? Any recommendations? And he was silent for a moment. And then he said, I think you had perhaps best follow the pretense of accident. And that was it. Like no addresses, no handy monastery <laughs> guidebook. I think you had perhaps best follow the pretense of accident. That's exactly the way it worked out. You know, I went to India. We started in Dharamsala because I'd heard the Dalai Lama lived there. I'd heard he was a Buddhist. Um, and there were meditation classes and there were wonderful teachers. And uh, it was the kind of situation where, you know, it's like when something just doesn't work. It's like... <laughs> It just didn't work. I'd go to the meditation class and be told, oh, the translator's like gone for a few weeks, you know? So I'd go back in two weeks and say, oh, the teacher had to go to the dentist who's in Calcutta, the other end of India, you know? <laughs> Come back in three weeks. So, then, you know, it just wasn't working. And I did overhear a conversation at a restaurant um, saying that there was going to be an international Hatha yoga conference in New Delhi. And I thought, oh, that's it. I'll go there. And that's where I'll find a teacher. And I went there and it was like a completely, nearly completely dismal experience where the low point was when these yogis and swamis were pushing and shoving against each other to be the first to grab the microphone and speak. And I thought, oh, great, you know. This is hopeless, but also at that conference, a young man named Dan Goldman, who you know we tend to know these days as the author of Emotional Intelligence, you know, all these years later, 
Mm-hmm. But uh, Dan was giving a talk at that conference. He was at the time a graduate student in psychology. He was studying meditation. And somehow he ended up giving a talk at this conference. And he mentioned at the end of the talk that he was on his way to this town called Bodhgaya in India, where uh, there was going to be an intensive 10 day like immersion course into meditation. And it was very practical and you didn't have to join anything. You didn't have to, you know, reject anything else. Exactly what I've been looking for. And I thought, Oh, that's it. That's what, that's what I need. And it was it, you know, I, and actually many others followed after Dan to, to Bodhgaya and joined in this course. And that began January 7th, 1971. What was your what was your feeling of India being completely opposite of of Buffalo, New York? I mean, because you know, like you said, this is before a lot of conveniences, and you're traveling around in cars. You know, seventeen hours you're on trains. It's like you got deli belly stuff happening, and you got to watch out what you're eating, and it's like all these people and animals, and just all this stuff is all this commotion is happening. Did you feel like you were home when you were in India, or were you kind of tolerating it to get the knowledge that you came for? I felt like I was home, and um, the, I was also terrified. I mean, you know, I was also. <laughs> That was true too, but I felt like I was home just to, I mean, it took a while to get there. Cause like I said, you know, we took a plane to England and then the overnight express, the Oriental express train, which was not overnight, the Oriental express train, which was like days and days to get to Turkey. And then, you know, ferries and boats and buses and trains and, you know, all the way through the, the mid East to get to Pakistan and then, and then India, and, and somehow as soon as I got to India, I, I just felt at home. And uh, there was something also about the openness of it after all the kind of concealment of my earlier life. It's like, there's street life. Like if you, I, you know, take, uh, I remember bringing in some of our Indian teachers from India to visit here in the States. and. And it would get to be in certain, a lot of places, you know, eight o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night. And the teacher would say, where's everybody? You know, like <laughs> the streets are empty. That's so unnatural. And, you know, there was so much openness. And um, yeah, I felt, I felt quite at home there. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Okay. So you're at this 10 day retreat. You meet, this is in Bogaya, correct? And you meet Ram Dass as well yeah. for the first time. What was, what was your impression of him? Well, the teacher of the retreat was S.N. Goenka, and he had just mm-hmm. left Burma um, pretty recently before then um, to visit his mother who'd been ill in, in Bombay, and she got better, and he began teaching. And so he was very new to teaching in uh, outside of Burma. And... Um, because Dan Gullman had in, in, uh, inspired quite a number of people from that conference to go. This was this was a group of people, you know, it was a real gathering. And uh, at that retreat, Ramdas was a student there. He was attending as a student. He, of course, had been to India himself before. He um, was Ramdas, not Richard Alpert at that mm-hmm. point. He'd come back to India after, I think, a couple of years in America. There was a group of people sort of with him. They'd heard him on the radio. They, you know, encountered him somehow in the States. And uh, they they were kind of with him, really trying to meet his teacher, his guru. But, you know, this was, I mean, both old style. He was an old style guru. You didn't exactly know where he was going to be next. And. He'd appear and disappear and be somewhere else, you know, like 
Um, so they didn't know where he was, where the teacher was. And there was no, you know, you couldn't text everybody or email everybody and say, hey, you spotted, you know. So they were trying to do worthy things with their time, you know. Um, and and so there's a whole group of them who were attending this course with Ram Das. So it was Ram Das, uh, Krishna Das, you know, lots of people who were still good friends. And, um, you know, I look back, Ram Das, he was like the patriarch. He'd already been fired from Harvard. He'd already had a guru and a new name. And looking back, I realized, oh, he was like 38 or 39 years old. He seemed so mm. old, you know. <laughs> he was really he was really the patriarch. And it was when we were there together practicing uh, that the first box, the first appearance of Be Here Now, his, his mm -hmm. great book, was not a book, it was a box, mm -hmm. you know, and everything was like loose, the re the chai recipes and, the, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. So I remember him getting the box and we all opened the box and we were looking and ooing and aahing and looking at all this stuff and uh, everything felt, you know, very fresh. It was really very new and exciting. It was such a sense of community and such a sense of, uh, discovery. It's like, oh, look what my breath feels like when I do this, or, you know, every little thing was so meaningful. Mm. Were you, you, so you were still relatively young at that time. You're like 19, 20 years old. Um, were yeah, you, 18. would you have been, if, if I were to speak with Dan or somebody who was around at that time, Krishna Das, and say, what were your reflections of Sharon at the time? What, what would they have said? Uh, she's very quiet. <laughs> She's very sweet. <laughs> um, uh, Krishna Das and I, you know, teach together a fair amount. And uh, we often tell the same story, each from our own perspective, because uh, Goenka taught many retreats in a row. And there'd be little gaps in between and, uh, and then there'd be another retreat. And at one of the gaps, um, Dan had gone to Allahabad, which is where it's the grounds of this huge gathering, the Kumbh Mela, you know, mm -hmm. which has this astrological points of like every four years is this and every 12 years is this. And when it's the big one, you know, it's millions and millions and millions of people who come together to bathe in the Ganges. And the largest gathering of humans on earth, yeah. they say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dan had gone there and then he came back to Bodh Gaya and we were practicing and then the, the mail was over, but um, this group of people around Ramdas, some people who had really were at those courses because of Ramdas, some people who met Ramdas there, um, decided that they were going to get in this bus. Oh my God, you were there? I was there, sure. On well, the bus? No, no, no. I waved goodbye oh, to the bus. Okay. <laughs> That's why Krishna Das and I tell the story, the story, same story from two different angles. Like, okay. They decided they were going to get in this bus and tour around looking for Maharaji. And they had no idea where he was. Um, and there was no, again, you know, it wasn't like, blog someone was going to write spotted and you know Benares is guru new curly baba um and so i remember deliberating internally do i want to get on that bus you know and, and uh i thought no i just discovered this practice it's really important for me they don't even know where the guy is you know like and I'm just going to keep meditating here. So when they left, Ramdas was the only one with a name like Ramdas. They were like Linda and Jeffrey. And, and uh, they somewhere, as they tell the story, because now I'm, I'm not privy to it, they're on the bus. And Danny, Dan Goldman wants to have the bus detour and see the grounds where the Kumbamela had been. It wasn't even there anymore, but... And Ramdas said no. He he wanted to go right on to Delhi, and they had this discussion. And finally, Ramdas said, "Okay, let's just you know, we'll go look at the the grounds of the mela." And 
So they they got there, and there was Maharaji waiting for them by the side of the road. And uh, apparently he had woken up that morning and told his hosts, you know, make lunch for, I don't know, let's say 28 people. And there were exactly 28 people, including the bus driver. You know, so at one point I said to Krishnadas, well, how long did it take you to find him? And he said, 10 hours. <laughs> you know, so it was life choices. It was very interesting right there. That's one of my favorite Ram Dass stories. The, the bus yeah. ride to get ice cream or go to the Kumbh Mela. <laughs> yeah, that's why he wanted to go to Delhi. He was to get ice cream. <sighs> So you had your first experience. I think it was the last day of the 10 day retreat where, where, um, Guanca, S and Guanca talked about meta. Yeah. And talk about that, how that made you feel. And yeah, well, the main engine for that retreat and for many, many approaches to meditation is mindfulness, which is really a way of, trying to get closer to your experience, having your, your awareness be less cluttered, less filled with like old fears or future projections so you can see much more accurately what your experience really is. It's like maybe it's pain, but it's not pain plus, you know, the anticipation of the next 50 years not feeling any better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was really the the essential tool in that 10 day retreat. But right at the end, almost as a ceremonial way of saying goodbye, going to introduce this other method, which is called Metta, M-E-T-T-A, two T's. And uh, Metta means loving kindness. So it was, it was one particular form, one way of doing it. There are many, many ways of doing it, but it was my first introduction. And so there, rather than trying to just get closer to the truth of your experience, whatever it is, you're actually um, actively offering kind of goodwill and well wishes to yourself and to others. And so uh, going and did it a certain way through sensation in the body, because that was very much his approach with mindfulness is, is being aware, but it's almost like fill your body with the sense of warmth and caring. And then you offer it ultimately to all of life, including mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I was just riveted. I thought, wow, what's this? You know, like I really want to learn this method, but I never, um, I mean, I studied it. You know, and I, I tried to understand it. And of course, I was sitting with Goenka at times, and he was uh, doing it in that same way right at the end of, of his mindfulness retreat. And um, it was only in 1985 that I, I went to Burma and did a three-month intensive meditation retreat on loving kindness on that particular mm -hmm. technique. And you know, they they taught it uh, somewhat differently than Goenka had done, but it's the same essence. And uh, it became hugely important for me in my practice. And that was my intuition beforehand anyway. It's why, you know, I really wanted to learn it. And so that was 85. I came back, I started teaching it right away mm -hmm. as a method. And then... Um, uh, my first book was called Loving Kindness, and that came out about 10 years later because I'm very slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so after Deepama had ordained you um, a future teacher and you kind of pushed back on that, um, this is where we're in 1974 or something along those lines, right? And you still are kind of wandering around, linking up with Joseph in yeah. Colorado and staying in these houses with people and stuff like that. Can you just walk us through where, how you went from there to how you guys ended up starting the center in, in Barry. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I, you know, went and saw Deepa in uh, Calcutta in 1974, came back to the States. I was on the East coast. Uh, I was with my family. I did sort of the, you know, preparatory work for like getting a new visa to go back to India forever and all that. And 
In the meantime, did they think you? Did they think you were weird when you were back with your family? Yeah, I mean, everyone was so glad to see me, and they're so relieved, you know. And <laughs> but, um, you know, I also didn't have the either the sophistication or the language to really, you know, explain like if they said to me as they did, are you still Jewish? I would say, <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, like I didn't know how to describe what I'd been doing and, you know, um, you know, but a group of us thought, oh, well, this is another whole Ronda story, but um, Joseph Goldstein, who was also at my first retreat, that's where we mm -hmm. met, uh, had come back to the States about six months before I did. And uh, he was traveling across the country with some friends and he stopped in Boulder, Colorado. So um, Boulder was the site where Trunk Perimpeche, same Trunk Perimpeche, you know, that had sent me off with uh, the pretense of accident, no addresses, um, was establishing this institute called Naropa, Naropa Institute. Now it's um, university because it's gotten affiliated, but in those days it was an institute and it was the first uh, place I'd heard of where there was like meditation and textual study of Hinduism and Buddhism and Tai Chi martial arts and, you know, uh, so many things being offered. And uh, so this is prior to the official opening, which was in the summer and Joseph stopped there and asked in their office, uh, he said, you know, I've been living in India for seven years. My teachers have told me to teach. I've started teaching in India. Would you like me to teach a course? And they said, no, thanks. You know, so, so he went on to Berkeley and as he tells the story, of course we'd known Ram Dass from India and, you know, we're, we're good friends. And so he said he got to Berkeley and he called Ram Dass and the answering machine, which is what it was in those days, had a very forbidding message, like not talking to anybody, don't leave a message, you know. <laughs> so Joseph went off to Telegraph Avenue and uh, to continue on the pretense of accident theme, uh, he he's needed to use a bathroom. So he went into some cafe and they said uh, only for customers. And in a way I still can't figure out like he didn't buy like a bagel or something, you know, he decided to go to another place to look for a bathroom. And I think he was, he was on his third place when he walked in and there was Ramdas <laughs> sitting in the cafe. <laughs> so Ramdas was about to go to Boulder to Naropa Institute where he had like a mega class of like a thousand people. And uh, he asked Joseph if he would come lead the meditation subgroup so we say he gave Joseph his first teaching job in the States, mm -hmm. which is true. So Joseph went to Boulder and uh, was very, very popular teaching that. So he was actually invited to stay on for the second summer session. But this is still the first summer session. And uh, some friends and I decided, you know what, let's go to Boulder and visit Joseph. So... Uh, we went to Boulder and Joseph was living in a one bedroom apartment, like a student apartment that Naropa had given him. And at one point, nine of us moved in to his one bedroom apartment. And it was really onerous. Jack Cornfield was living down the hall. That's where we met. And uh, I stayed on with Joseph for the second summer session. I was kind of his TA. And then we got invited to teach a month long retreat, Joseph and I, so we did. And then we got a letter from somebody saying, you know, I can get together some friends and a cook, would you come teach a retreat? So it was Jack, Joseph and I, and a couple of other friends and it would be different configurations of some of us. And we had nothing, you know, we had no home, we had nothing. Uh, I mean, they had, you know, both still living parents, you know, but on the East Coast. And, um, but we were just like sleeping in people's living room couches, literally, and crashing at people's homes. And 
one day one of the people who I think had <laughs> hosted us the most said in some self-defense, like, I have a rental property down near Santa Cruz. Why don't you move in there? So we did. And we opened it as a retreat center where it was just a house, but, you know, uh, you could come and do your own retreat and we would cook for you and just have a supportive environment. And somebody came through at one point uh, writing a book and wanting that kind of atmosphere. And he said, you know, you should really start a real retreat center. You should start a center of your own where it would be like a kind of sacred site in this country. It would be a place where the kind of energy that's generated when people come together doesn't have to disperse. And he said, I know that people can help you. They're all in Massachusetts. And he was right. Uh, they were the people. Um, uh, you know, formed uh, um, a, a nonprofit, formed a board, uh, were able to kind of understand what we were looking for, found it, did the negotiation. Uh, we ended up buying this property in Barry, Massachusetts for $150,000, which we did not have. This is, you know, an institutional building or set of buildings that sleep about a hundred and everything, you know, kitchen and whatever it was $150,000. So we, uh, it was owned by the Catholic church, by the fathers of the blessed sacrament. So they gave us a $50,000 mortgage. We raised $50,000 and we couldn't get a bank to give us a mortgage for the other 50,000. So these friends went off to the bank and they personally took out loans so that we could open, open the doors. And uh, so that's the Insight Meditation Society in Barry, Massachusetts. So, okay, I a couple of questions about this. You know, when you get a room of meditators together, usually they're not very business savvy people, yeah, especially yeah. people who've been spent a lot of time in India and you're following your heart and doing all these kind of kind of what people would consider airy fairy things, you know, especially if you work in the banking industry, who was the driving force? Who was the organizer? Who was the task um, rabbit in that, in that circle that made sure that things, the, the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed and things like that? Well, it was, I mean, we were really lucky that group of people that formed the first board, you know, the first board of directors and they quickly saw, you know, we were not that capable and, <laughs> you know, so many realms. And uh, we had a policy for a long time, which we used to call the separation of church and state, you know, where the um, teachers would decide like who else to invite to teach and uh, what would be taught there. And the board would decide everything a board is responsible for, you know, the finances and, and so on. And so ultimately they had a lot of power because, you know, and clearly we knew nothing, you know, like somebody said in a very early meeting, you know, cause we, we also grew up in a tradition in Asia, grew up in, in that sense, you know, um, where you did not really charge for the teachings, you know, mm -hmm. like, in some of the places we paid room and boards, other places we paid nothing because even that was provided and voluntary donations to the teachers happened, you know, or to the monastery. And, and suddenly we're in the land of, you know, um, well, the staff really needs health insurance. You can't, you know, fairly have a staff here and not, not give them health. And it's like, huh, do I need health insurance too? <laughs> I guess I do. It's a different world. And, um, you know, so when we open the doors, we charge $6.50 a night. And uh, we had no money, you know, like somebody's father gave them a car. That's why we had a car. Or, you know, it was like those days. And, uh, you know, so I remember a very early board meeting, one of the board members said, well, you're not thinking about depreciation 
so I or somebody said, what's depreciation, you know? And they said, well, you know, like, what if a roof le starts leaking or, and we said, oh, well, you know, we'll just raise money for it. Like not realizing we weren't in Asia anymore, you know? So it was a real education. And, and I think necessary, but it was all dependent on those people. You know, we could never have done it without them. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.